Thank you. So Kelvin has spent over 30 years providing a wide range of occupational hygiene services to clients in the public and private sectors. Currently serves as occupational hygiene lead at Hinkley Point C, the largest and most complex construction site in Europe. And prior to recent appointment as Director of Occupational Hygiene at Health Partners, Kelvin maintained an independent consultancy business for 18 years. Kelvin's experience has included roles as Head of Environmental Health and Safety at Stanger Consultants, Chief Occupational Hygienist at Wimtech Environmental, which was partly part of the WIMPI group, and Operations Director for the Occupational Health and Environment Divisions at National Britannia Limited. Kelvin is immediate past president of the British Occupational Hygiene Society, or BOHS, and is a Chartered Fellow of the Faculty of Occupational Hygiene. Kelvin chaired the BOHS COVID-19 Expert Group and winners of the IIRSM Award for Risk Team of the Year 2021. He's a popular thing for our events and uh, is always well received. So welcome, Kelvin. Uh, any questions you have, please put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of Kelvin's presentation. Kelvin, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to share screen and hopefully you should all see, uh, perhaps Keith, you can give me a thumbs up. You can see that yep. present. Yeah, yep. grand. Okay. Well, the subject for the talk today is the, uh, the occupational hygienist uh, uh, come up. This is a presentation I've given several times over the years uh, relating to uh, what a good occupational hygiene survey uh, should look like, uh, particularly in the context of somebody just engaging an occupational hygienist for a, a one-off project, say, uh, typically for a one-day survey or two-day survey, uh, something like that, okay? Now, now, the issue is, is that uh, over the years, there's been a, a lot of folk out there uh, calling themselves occupational hygienists and pretending to do occupational hygiene work, um, but poorly qualified uh, uh, to do so. Uh, and part of the reason why that happens is that a lot of folk are, are not conscious of what they should be looking for when they engage uh, occupational hygiene uh, consultancy work. So I want to address some points on that today to help you uh, and to make sure you don't end up uh, spending money on a report uh, which isn't uh, uh, that helpful uh, in the long run. So if I can just advance the slide here, which... Uh... Ah, oh, there we go. So the reason why an occupational hygiene survey may be required, because you might have uh, enforcement action on you by the regulator, could be an insurance requirement, something arising out of your routine health and safety management systems, whether that's an audit or compliance monitoring, uh, there might be a, a dispute uh, of some sort, uh, it could be sort of a kind of union issue going on or there could be uh, an ill health issue of some sort. Maybe people are experiencing discomfort, irritation, dermatitis, uh, or whatever. And so you want to engage an occupational hygienist to investigate uh, your workplace. Uh, typically, uh, that uh, engages a consultant to come along just for one day uh, on site. That tends to be uh, the consultant's lot. Now there's an issue with that, um, if you get, um, your, your, your fag packet out and, and a biro and do a quick calculation on the back of there, you'll find that if you're going to site for one day, presuming you're seeing about six to eight hours of the operation that's uh, in, in question here, given how long that operation is going for in the space of 12 months, when you come along on one day, it may well be the case that you're only seeing that operation for 0.03% of the time it's actually running. So straight away, you've got to start asking yourself some questions about how, what the, the veracity is of turning up on one day, taking a few measurements and drawing conclusions from that. Sure, you've got to be careful here, haven't you? Because things vary enormously from day to day for a myriad of reasons that we haven't got to go into today. So planning and getting this right on this day is absolutely uh, crucial, okay? I've just made a note there on that slide there, you know, one day per year, you know, 0 0.03%. In inverted commas, you should be here when, yeah? How many times uh, do we hear that from staff? It's all very well you turning up your sound elevator and dust meter today, but my goodness, you should be here when X, Y, Z happens. Well, we should have explored that before we arrived on site. So that we're confident that when we turn up on site, uh, we can uh, account for that question of you should be here when, and, and, we're, and we're ready for it. You can see a 
chap there with the um, with a road saw cutting up some uh, metalwork and the like. To give me some example of the kind of variations that can take place from day to day. Uh, so. Um, uh, I have a situation here where they're using a road saw to like uh, to dismantle and take apart uh, pieces of, of metal and equipment here, and uh, so I'm asked to look at the uh, the vibration levels uh, in that saw. So top left hand page, you can see they are measuring 2.62 meters per second squared as the saw is cutting through a three core cable. Now it so happens that uh, if you take a two core cable, as in the bottom left hand picture you will get a different vibration level than you will if you cut a three core cable. And then the vibration level changes if you're cutting, say in the top right hand picture there, if you're cutting in a horizontal uh, axis uh, along those, um, that sheath over a metal bar, you will get a different vibration level again. And then if you lift up that road saw into like the vertical plane as you have in the bottom right hand slide, you will get another level of vibration. And yet people pretend you can come along to check the vibration level on the saw, and all you have to do is attach a meter to it, uh, let it run for a minute on something, and you've got your level. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. There's all kinds of reasons, all kinds of things that can change the vibration level on that. And so to get an accurate assessment of the risk posed through vibration exposure on these bits of kit, you have to account for all the different scenarios and conditions under which that condition is used. And then, of course, we've got a right hand and a left hand. When the saw is in the horizontal plane, you'll find most of the vibrations happening in the, in, in the right hand. When you lift it in the vertical plane, that switches to the left hand. So what's your call going to be? Are you going to pretend that if you can come along and test 30, 40 tools in a day, perhaps one minute at a time on a tool, you're going to get an accurate picture? It's, it's, not, it's just not the case, is it? You've got to think these through carefully and be a lot more circumspect about the data that you're collecting. Other issue with um, one day survey is, is they know you're coming, man. OK, and, uh, and you turn up, they know you're coming. That's going to change the way work is done on the day. Uh, and you're standing there, man in a white coat with a clipboard, with a scientific -y looking equipment. Um, and, and people either get intimidated by that. Sometimes they play up to the, to the fact that equipment's there. Uh, sometimes they're excessively uh, cautious, uh, which was the case in the uh, example I'm showing you here uh, in the photo. I turned up on site. These guys are doing some carpentry work. They're making uh, planter boxes. And uh, I turned up and the chaps were off to uh, having their, their tea and their coffee. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm alone in the workshop and I'm rummaging through the cupboards and the drawers and whatever else. And, uh, and I come across uh, the dust masks in a, in a dusty little box at the back of one of the cupboards. I replace it, shut all the cupboards and I wait for them to turn up, which they do. They came for the door and they say like, uh, well, here we are. Uh, I said, I'm your dust man for the day. Uh, oh yeah, we were expecting you, they said. Uh, right, Bill, says Jeff to his mate, Bill, we're, seeing as we're gonna do this dusty work, now we better put our dust masks on, hadn't we? Um, yes, we had, because that's what we always do. We're, we're very kind of like, uh, you know, diligent uh, chaps here. And I watch as they open the drawers and they open the cupboards and they rummaging around in the workshop, trying to find where they left uh, their dust masks. It is just painfully obvious that they are not in the habit of wearing these dust masks from day to day. Eventually they find them. And when they do put them on, you can see how they are fitted. I mean, he's dropped the dust mask over the top of his nose because it's a bit uncomfortable if you put it up uh, over your nose. And so that's how we like to wear them, apparently. It's getting zero protection there at all. So on this day, they are pretending uh, to be, uh, well, they're being excessively cautious, uh, taking precautions they wouldn't normally do uh, if I wasn't there. Sometimes, People are excessively reckless when I'm there. I've caught people um, standing underneath uh, metalwork in their uh, and other kind of like upper surfaces, shelf surfaces and the like in their workplace, putting uh, standing underneath it. Where they're wearing my dust sampler on their shoulder and they're brushing dust into my dust sampler as they uh, are going about the work. Or I've also come across people vacuuming up dust off the workbenches with my sampling equipment. Now, the issue there is I get results back. It's very easy to tell. You get one result as one milligram per cubed, another result comes back at two, another one at one and a half, and then one result comes back in a 250 milligrams per meter cubed. And it's usually pretty obvious that someone's been messing about with your samples. Not always, okay? So you have to be conscious and alert to the fact they know you're coming and the effect that is gonna have on the measurements that you take and the sort of observations you make. 
Uh, this is the same workshop. Uh, that's the LED system there. Um, no prizes today for spotting the fundamental flaw uh, with the way that LED system connects to the hood over the, uh, over the blade. So the problem, pro problems that we get with uh, one day surveys, are, first off, um, do you have somebody qualified in this area to do the work? Are you using a qualified hygienist, somebody who's trained in it? It is astonishing how many people are out there uh, providing these services and don't have uh, diddly squat training uh, in, in the subject. Get a qualified uh, occupational hygienist. Now you can go on the BOHS website and on there you'll find a directory of, uh, of service providers, directory of occupational hygiene consultants. Uh, that's your first port of call. Or at least you should be looking for somebody who's uh, AFOH, LFOH qualified uh, and the like. Now you ought to know that the health and safety executive right now has got a team of staff out there um, addressing this particular area, people who are doing poor quality occupational hygiene work. Uh, I've been speaking to the, uh, the members of the team. Um, last uh, I spoke to them, there's a, a, at least 25 investigations going on. There's prohibition notices on at least two uh, consultancies claiming to do occupational hygiene surveys, many others, uh, under investigation uh, at the moment. The HSC is on the case with uh, people pretending to offer occupational hygiene services when they're just not properly qualified to do so. And I won't labor, we haven't got time to go into today what the consequences have been uh, uh, for that. So other common problems with the one day survey, uh, poor research, planning, strategy. From what I've shown you so far, you've already picked up some idea of that from the, from the vibration slide. You've got to think through uh, the, the problem that you're looking at, uh, what you need to address and have a strategy and a plan to approach it properly. People fail to identify the hazards properly, uh, what, what it is we should be looking at uh, uh, on site, often due to a poor dialogue with the client. The client will phone up and say, I need this, that and the other survey doing. Um, well, well, why do they think that? Um, just, you know, politely and graciously ask a few questions about the nature of the problem before just uh, going along with whatever the, the client uh, is saying. Over-reliance on measurement results is a, is, a, is a big issue. People tend to see occupational hygiene as coming along with a meter or a dust sample or whatever, producing a number from a day, comparing it with a limit and saying, there you are, we're above or below a limit and, and that's it. It is a lot more than that, as we'll come to see in, in, in the following slides. Then we have poor observation skills. Uh, staff, um, sorry, a lot of consultants don't have a good bedside manner. They don't draw out of staff or have the soft skills to be able to find out what happens when you're not there looking uh, over their shoulder. Uh, there's a set of skills required to do that well, yeah? Uh, and then the lack of observation skills are just can be just down to sheer laziness on the, on the people you might have engaged, or lack of thoroughness, people who are just not curious or inquisitive enough about what makes a workplace tick. Then we have poor interpretation of data. I'll have a slide I'll come back to a little later. But a lot of occupational hygiene surveys, when you see the way the data is discussed, it is statistically illiterate in the way people have discussed that data in the report. We'll come back on to that. And finally, you see a lot of unhelpful reports where the client has got 60 pages worth uh, of data, all kinds of photos and slides and copied and pasted uh, chunks of the cost regulations, but little in there telling them what they actually have to do uh, to put a problem right. So those are the common problems. Let's look at some of the consequences of poor surveys. This was uh, a uh, soldering fume uh, exposure assessment uh, done here. Uh, I got called in after the, uh, the HSC had been in and weren't happy uh, with a, a survey that had been done. Now, um, the um, enforcement authority, like I say, were dissatisfied. There was a report um, produced uh, saying that uh, everything was just fine. Uh, however, uh, there was no mention in the report of how those measurements uh, were done uh, or what kind of work was subject to the monitoring. Apparently, the person who called themselves an occupational hygienist turned up, put some sort of sampling device on people, and then disappeared to the local cafe and turned up again at three or four o'clock in the afternoon to pick it up. Sent the samples off for analysis and they all came well below the workplace exposure limit. And this report was just ticked off, everything is, is just fine. If I recall rightly, the report wasn't much more than a side of A4. 
So uh, we went uh, uh, along and uh, we carried out um, uh, another survey uh, uh, as requested. Now you can see that chap there has got a sampling device located just on the left-hand side of his safety spectacles there. Now that's how you should do solder fume analysis to catch that plume of fume coming into the face. Why is it on the left-hand side? Because he's left-handed. If he's a right-handed guy and you're, and you're soldering fume, if you've got the sample in the wrong place, you could miss the amount of fume he's breathing in by an order of magnitude if you don't have the sampler on the side of the leading hand of the worker because they lean into the job with a leaning hand, okay? So we repeat the survey and we find one member of staff was one and a half times the workplace exposure limit for solder fume and the rest were about a half uh, the exposure limit. This is just a handful of workers. Solder fumes are potent asthmogen. This was very serious indeed that this had been missed. The consequences could have been catastrophic for these staff. Could have been life-changing, career-ending. So question for you, uh, perhaps for the chemist among you. Um, do these measurements matter? In terms of over-reliance on monitoring data, I go into a chemical consolidation works where they're handling a wide range of chemicals and, uh, and I, there's three staff in there and I measure their exposure to the various uh, chemicals you can see on, on the left there. And those are the results uh, that I've got. And uh, you know, PG, DB and PP are just the initials of the people who I was uh, carrying out sampling on. And I can assure you that in every instance, all those numbers uh, are below the workplace exposure limit uh, by, by quite a, a margin. Uh, but here's the thing. Would you be reassured simply by those numbers there? Now, very often, if this was a, if you were face to face today, I would be asking the crowd, uh, can anybody tell me what kind of health effects you might expect if you expose somebody to that mixture of volatiles and solvents and whatever else? So what do you get if you get exposed to that mixture? Of course, people look at me blankly and I respond to them and say, well, neither do I. I'm not sure either. But I tell you what, it's not going to be good. Now, some of those uh, materials on there are carcinogens, for example. And do they have synergistic effects with other solvents? I bet you the research doesn't exist. Now, the measurements may look reassuring. Now, if you had done some good observations on site, now we took a, you know, a wide range of observations on the site and we found that there's no local exhaust ventilation. There was no health surveillance to check on these people's health. No adequate training. No monitoring records apart from uh, an A4 sheet of results, which shows no context or how the measurements were done or anything similar to the soldering job. There was no appropriate personal protective equipment. The fellas were wearing domestic marigold kitchen gloves, the kind of things you'd use for doing the dishes. And there's highly inadequate cost assessments. I had plenty to uh, chat about with the managing director of this place. It, it got awkward and tense in the conversation. Ah, yes, says the managing director, but we've been doing the monitoring for years. You know, all I wanted you from you was the numbers because the results show we're okay. Of course they're not okay. Uh, these staff are at serious risk. Plus you've got to bear in mind, they knew I was coming on that day. So that colors some of the numbers that, uh, that I get. And the range of observations you may give us no confidence whatsoever that this client could uh, properly manage uh, their, their cost. So it mustn't over rely on measurement uh, results. Now your client dialogue, uh, what kind of like a thing should the uh, occupational hygienist have been talking to you about? Um, well, I've just, um, you know, this is not exhaustive at all. Uh, I'm just uh, scratching my head thinking, what's the kind of thing I normally ask? And I come up with this, you know, you know what, what is the problem uh, that you're talking about? To talk to me about it, what does it look like? Uh, where is it in your work? Any particular, is it spread across all your staff or is it like in one area uh, or, or another? Tell me a bit about what you do. What kind of processes, what kind of chemicals? Can you send me any uh, MSDSs for the hazardous uh, agents uh, that you've got here? Then once you've got that information, you've got to do your homework. You have to thoroughly research that to come up with a proposal and a strategy which is going to be helpful uh, to uh, your, your client, okay? You also have to ask yourself, what's the history of this issue? Has it only just started happening in the last like a few months or has it been going on for a long time? Who exactly uh, is concerned? 
How many staff do you have and how many of them actually are affected by this? Now, those two questions are very important for looking at uh, what we call nocebo effects or psychosocial issues. Just because somebody is saying this workplace is making me ill doesn't mean to say the workplace is making them ill. Uh, the workplace can often be a proxy for some kind of like an issue which is going on elsewhere uh, in their lives or some kind of psychosocial issue. And it expressed itself as people in the workplace complaining that that is making them ill. We'll get back to that a little later in the presentation, but you have to be alert to that. It's not all about hard science. There's a lot of soft skills involved in getting this right as well. And then finally, the thing I want to know is what is the working pattern? So it came up from a client on a Teams call this morning. Uh, we've got about uh, 12 visits uh, lined up across the UK for uh, looking at a particular issue. Um, and my question to them was, uh, OK, I've got to work at a diarised schedule uh, to visit your plants. Um, now, it's tempting, isn't it? It's, it's 12 sites to visit across the UK. Do I go to one on the Monday and then a Tuesday, a Wednesday, Thursday, and then the Friday? Well, hang on a minute. What's the busiest day? Uh, surely I should be planning to come along when like, there's most work going on. And it, it does follow a pattern in the week. Mondays and Fridays tend to be, on the whole, uh, less productive than Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays in many plants. So I've got to be conscious of this. I want to avoid somebody looking at my final report and saying, oh, those numbers are all very well, but Kelvin Williams should have been here when I want to, I want to anticipate that and, and, and cover that before I go on site. So making it count when we're going to site, um, if, if possible, I, I like to visit a site uh, to make a proposal for a client. Uh, it's not essential, um, but it's, uh, I think it's best if you can. And then I like to walk through the process. I like to walk through where you know, stuff comes through the door, where we unpack it, uh, where we pour it into things, where we chop it up, uh, where we boil it up, change it, uh, nail it, uh, glue it, wherever we do. Uh, and then where we finish it, QA it, eventually package it, and what the warehousing is. I like to follow the, the whole thing through from start to finish, so I can identify all the different groups of people who might be exposed to the agent uh, of concern. Uh, very often, uh, some of the highest exposures are not occurring uh, on the production line itself, but the highest exposures are occurring to, for example, uh, the maintenance staff, the maintenance engineers, or somebody who unpacks uh, materials, that, that kind of thing, okay? Particularly if you're in like, um, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, where there's a dispensary uh, of some sort. And it's the dispensing of the materials rather than the processing of them where the highest exposures can be. You want to identify the exposed groups, um, and then you want to collect the data on shift times, production schedules, make sure you're there. Um, I, I've put worst case there. You don't want to go overboard with that, of course. Sometimes people say you should be here when, and they describe a scenario which occurs about once for an hour every three years. I mean, you don't want to go aboard. It's got to be reasonable, okay? But you want to be there when it's busy. OK, and finally, when thinking through your proposal, you're going to asking, let's look at what I'm doing. Let's look at what I'm proposing here. Actually, is it going to be helpful? Is it going to take this client forward and address the questions uh, that, that, that are really important to them? OK, so that's going to underpin uh, the whole uh, approach. Now, to make measurements that matter, let me give you an example here, um, a little bit quick case study. So uh, this is like a, a printing room uh, where there's a uh, uh, a lot of toner about, there's uh, photocopying going on, laser printing, this kind of thing. And um, the, the staff experienced eye irritation and respiratory irritation and, uh, and walked out. It was, it was, it was that bad. I, I got a call, uh, can you come along please and do an indoor air quality survey? They think there's uh, something in the air. Can you do an indoor air quality survey? And they had in mind a few things that perhaps uh, we, we should be looking for. Um, I could look for anything for an indoor air quality survey. So I've got to do my research. I've got to talk to the client. So I said, well, when, how long has this problem been going on for? Since last week. And before then, no problem. Okay, what happened last week? Or what have you changed? There's been no change in the substances, they say, no change in the chemicals in this place whatsoever. It's all been exactly the same. No new equipment, no, no same printing gear. It's all exactly the same stuff. We just can't understand what's going on. Something must have changed. Before, you didn't have a problem. After last week, you've got a problem. Something, anything in this work environment, talk to me, what, what's changed? Well, the only thing that's changed, they said, is that we introduced an uninterruptible power supply, which is this uh, box you can see uh, at the back here. But there's no chemicals in that. It's just a box of wires. Nevertheless, it's the only thing that's changed. Let's rip it apart and take a look at it. So we look at the back of the uh, uninterrupted power supply, and this is what we see. 
Now, it's a little difficult to see from this slide, but all this uh, brown stuff on some of the internals here is a lacquer. And if you were standing in front of it, you'd uh, perhaps like me be able to put lean forward, reach out with your finger and almost like draw up a slodge of this stuff on the end of your finger. It's been slathered on and it's still pasty and quite viscous uh, on there. It's supposed to have, it's a lacquer, it's supposed to have cured. I also found out that the temperature in the back of here is about 70 degrees centigrade in those parts, okay? So I've got, an, what I'm seeing is an uncured lacquer or partially cured and a lot of heat involved. So we got hold of the manufacturer, got hold of the MSDS for that lacquer, and we found out that when it cures, it gives off formaldehyde vapors. Now then, We've gone from an indoor air quality survey with however much that might have cost to do to the possibility that there's a formaldehyde issue. Now, overnight, I ordered some gas detection tubes for formaldehyde. I came along the next morning, puffed them about, and sure enough, we had formaldehyde at just over the workplace exposure limit in the printing office. That was going on. So at minimal cost uh, to the client, we were able to solve the issue through careful dialogue, research, and doing our homework and making a measurement uh, that mattered. Another example here, this was a paper processing uh, situation going on. There were intermittent complaints of stinging eyes doing paper processing. So we asked who's affected? When does it occur? What kind of materials are we looking? We researched the kind of raw materials and additives. And then we made a decision on the measurement, which were, again was an aldehyde screen. Aldehydes are these kind of irritant chemicals, similar. Uh, well, uh, formaldehyde, for example, is, uh, is an aldehyde. And that was based on our research that it, it appeared to be that only when a certain type of product was being processed that you got the irritation. That took a little bit of homework to find that out. We contacted the manufacturer, we improved the, the ventilation, uh, and by, by working those problems and liaising with the workforce, we were able to, to overcome uh, the problem there. But we didn't just blindly go in and measure for, you know, indoor air quality, dust or whatever. We did a careful research and narrowed it down. Now, sometimes uh, things could be obvious. Uh, so um, you don't want to, um, you know, think about occupational hygiene as just about, you know, turning up and, uh, and doing uh, measurements and monitoring and the like. Um, I, I only want to do monitoring and, uh, and the cost of analysis and all the rest of if it's, if it's necessary. Case of dermatitis in the, in the workplace here, and uh, I've been asked to investigate it, and there's uh, no prizes for like uh, spotting the problem with the way they're managing uh, their glove use uh, on, on this one. No need for me to do surface sampling for chemicals and sensitize all the rest of it. It's obvious where the issue is coming from, okay? Uh, this one too, this is um, uh, a, um, a museum, outdoor museum, and they've got uh, Iron Age huts, and, uh, and the punters come along and they're able to see what life was like uh, in Iron Age times. And to give a bit of Iron Age uh, ambiance, uh, they light uh, a fire in there, and they put a few kind of like skins and things around, you know, to... Uh, uh, to, to wow the people who are visiting and, and entertain the kids. Now, all the while, we've got some volunteers in there who, uh, who are talking to the folk who come to the door and talking about uh, i &H history and the like. Now, I'm there because they're saying to me, um, we think we might have a problem with, uh, with smoke exposure. Why is that, I'm saying uh, on the phone? Well, like, uh, well, our staff are keeping the stinging eyes and uh, sore throats and, and stuff like this. Uh, so I go along and, and this is what I'm, I'm faced with, uh, egregious exposure to, to, to smoke there. And, and the manager comes out and says, we want a monitoring program. We want to check what the smoke levels are. Uh, and I'm saying, you don't, need, you don't need a monitoring program here. I mean, for heaven's sake, people's eyes are watering, they're coughing and sputtering. Look at it. Let's deal with that. Let's deal with the control of this as opposed to spending your money on the monitoring of it when the, the problem is obvious, okay? Allocate resources where they need it, not to just to state what we already know. Now, I mentioned about psychosocial effects. Um, this is more prevalent than you might uh, think. It is not unusual uh, for me to come along to a site where they're saying oh, this workplace is making me ill. And I just have to start asking myself some questions. Is it really the workplace? Or is there actually something else uh, going on here? Okay. Now, now, in my experiences, office environments are more prone to this, particularly where it's a large uh, open plan uh, office. Okay. And that's just in my experience. Now, the kind of thing that, uh, that triggers this off is that you often get kind of vague, nondescript symptoms. People would say, I feel lethargic by about two, three in the afternoon or 11 in the morning. 
my eyes are just a bit, you know, just a bit, feel a bit dry. Um, I just uh, feel like, uh, like like fatigued by, by all this kind of stuff. And it's um, sometimes uh, that, that can be genuine too. I'm not saying never say never here, but I'm just saying be alert if you get vague, nondescript uh, uh, symptoms, okay? You need to really carefully explore the history and extent of the problem. Take a step back, take the broad view before you start launching into there and doing all kinds of measurements, which can actually complicate the situation if you're not careful. You've got to ask yourself, is there a stress issue here going on, okay? Now, we haven't got time today, but there's been many occasions where I've looked at these situations and I've asked the question, sometimes with some of the, uh, the complainants in the room, uh, or on one occasion I asked this, do you think this could be a stress issue? And the complainant burst into tears in, in the room. That's exactly what it was. Uh, but my role as the consultant was to come along and, and call it out, I, I suppose, and then give leverage to other professionals who can engage them to help this person through whatever the, the issue happened to be. But they are stress, and whatever was upsetting them, uh, the, the release valve was uh, pinning it on the workplace, saying it's the workplace that's making me ill. And that's what's getting me down on the rest of it as a, as a digression from where the real issues were, okay? So be alert to this. It's more prevalent than you may think. There is very good literature uh, on the subject of this. And if you want to contact me offline, is there one or two good books uh, I, I can put you in touch with on that. So you're on site. Here we are. Um, as it happens, uh, we have turned up and we are doing measurements. Um, is it good enough just to put pumps on people and then just stand back and have a cup of tea and, and watch? Uh, not at all. 0.03% of the operational time in the year is what you've got the opportunity to see here. Not a lot. Uh, you've got a lot of work to do to get an idea of what uh, the context of the work is, um, what happens when you're not there, what you're not seeing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a tall order to get a lot together. You need to be gathering as much information as possible throughout the day. You need to be curious. You need to be taking notes, photos, uh, video, uh, continually throughout the day. I, I understand how this place works, okay? Uh, and here's the thing, um, we mustn't be afraid to be a pain. Uh, to be, we mustn't be afraid of the socially awkward situations. I've been in places where I'm looking for the cupboards and I've had somebody shout across the room, oi, you know, those cupboards are ours over there. Don't go looking in there. <laughs> That's like saying, uh, presenting me with a red button that says like, do not press this button. <laughs> And, um, and, and I opened, and on one occasion, um, I was assured that this client had no isocyanate containing materials, which using polyurethane. So as you know, that's a potent sensitizer and aspergen. And uh, I was told not to look in a certain area. I opened it and I came across pots of isocyanate material uh, uh, in there. It's just a one example. I, I, I could quote others, okay? So remember, we, we're not there to be popular, all right? I'm not there to be liked. Uh, I'm there to protect these staff and protect these businesses' interests, even if that you know, is, is a little bit awkward. That's what I'm there for. So I'm taking notes continually through the day. I've got to look at the work in sequence. How does it all fit together? How does it all work? Uh, questioning all the time, poking around, rummaging through cupboards. I use smoke tracer to look at air movements. It's a very quick and easy way of checking ventilation. I look at the PPE. Is it in date? Has it been selected properly? What kind of training have these people got? What do the risk assessments and method statements uh, uh, look like? Uh, I'm, I'm all over everything, man, okay? I need that to get a clear picture of what's happening here. I need to have a good bedside manner. I need to charm the, the staff to tell me what happens when I'm not there, okay? I've got to have good questions to draw out staff. If I see them using, you know, um, ragged gloves, I don't say, you don't change those gloves every day, don't you? Because they're going to say, uh, yeah, 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 I do every day. Now, the question is, how long do those gloves last you for, my friend? Uh, and he says, well, I, uh, buy, two, uh, I buy a pair and we wear the right hand glove for two, three weeks. Then we wear the left hand glove for two, three weeks. Uh, and then we turn them inside out and we use them for another couple of weeks. And then the fingers fall off and we change them. Good question draws out exactly uh, what you need to know. OK. Be prepared to be thorough. So I've mentioned uh, smoke generators, uh, dust lamp follows me wherever I go. That's where I use a lamp to illuminate the dust in the air, uh, gas detection equipment, cameras, videos, thermometers, and so forth. All this kind of stuff is, uh, will be uh, at the very least uh, in the boot of my car. Mustn't be afraid to be a nuisance. We're not there to be liked. Remember that, okay? You, you, you're there to kind of like uh, properly protect the, uh, these people's story, regardless of how, what they think about it. Be inquisitive, get the whole story. If it helps, uh, use checklists. 
And here's a thing, is to consider and investigate the feasibility of control measures while you're on site. So you look at the situation, you think, do you know what? I need to reduce the dust, I need to reduce that. How can I do that? Looking at this right here now, here I am standing in front of it. What could work, okay? And while you're on site looking at it, start asking people, look, I'm looking at this and I'm just thinking, do you think we could put a vent over there? Or do you think we could barrier that off? Do you think, would there be any practical reason why I can't do that? And talk through these things with the staff, investigate it while you're looking at it. That's the time to investigate these things. If you like, it's a manner of mentally writing the report while you're there on site, thinking, could you defend your ideas? I don't wanna be writing a report for the client then to throw it straight back at me and say, what a pile of nonsense. Didn't you check that it's utterly impractical? Well, I don't wanna get that feedback after I've written the report. I wanna find out right here, right now, what I need to defend or qualify the ideas that I have for the client. Now, by having dust lamps and smoke, um, uh, you can use photo, video very effectively to produce a bit of theater to demonstrate problems. As I have in this bakery here, I've set up the lamp and so you can see the amount of flower dust, which is drifting off that scale there. Um, outside of the lamp, you can't see the dust. In the lamp light, you can see just how gross an exposure uh, that is. Take a photo of it. Gather people around you, show them, get them to nod when you're doing these, these demonstrations and you're, and you're most of the way there to getting your point across, okay? So well-placed photographs, you know, here I put a sound elevator against somebody doing a, something very noisy, 104 decibels, and you can see where his hearing protection is, it's hanging around his neck, okay? So bear in mind, this chap knows the elf and safety is in, okay? You know, careful how you go, boys, elf and safety is visiting today, mind you go, best behavior. And nevertheless, I can still put a, Sun level meter there, he knows I'm taking a photo, he knows I've got the microphone, it still doesn't occur to him, he should put his hearing protection on. That speaks volumes to me about the management culture and all kinds of training issues and awareness and all the rest of it, as well as the brute issue of what the exposure happens to be. So this is using smoke on the left there, is a plasma cutting bench. Um, it's, uh, it's attached to a, an LEV, but if I puff a bit of smoke there with the LEV on, you see the, the smoke just sits there, doesn't go anywhere. So again, and a way of using reports to illustrate, uh, using um, visual means to illustrate the problems there. But you can also demonstrate solutions in this way as well. On the left, you've got a litho printer. You can see the top is open, it's got a wire guard, it's 94 decibels. Uh, these guys print things, they pack it. They got cardboard for the packing. I grab a piece of cardboard. I slap it on top of the litho printer. It goes from 94 down to 89 decibels. I take photos of that and I put it in the report. And I say, if you can do this with a bit of cardboard, what can we do with Perspex? I talk to the staff. If I put Perspex on there rather than have that wire guard, will that cause you a problem with production or anything? Not at all, they said. Okay, I've checked it out with the staff. We can do that. If cardboard can drop the noise levels by over half, then, you know, 20 quid a bit of Perspex, one or two hours overtime on a Saturday morning, and we could drop the noise levels by even further, perhaps. But this is powerful stuff, powerful persuasive stuff to put in your reports. Now I talked about uh, data uh, interpretation. Um, remember again, six to eight hours on site, you're only seeing that operation for 0.03% of the time it runs uh, in, a, in a year. And if you go on to site for one day, you're probably dealing with an inadequate sample size for doing robust statistical analysis. Occupational exposures vary enormously from day to day. Fact, they can vary by orders of magnitude between two people doing the same work. And the difference could be no more than one person is tall and the other is short. These kind of things can make the difference. So if you've just got a handful of results from one day, how confident can you be that those results represent what goes on the following day or the day before? or next week? Well, you've got to have some statistical nounce about you to be able to, uh, to say something about that, okay? Now, with that, of course, the context of the survey is a crucial report item. So you have to know, if you're generating numbers on a report, you have to know what kind of work, what was going on to generate those numbers. Because if the numbers are different at another time, you need to understand why that is. And you have to have the record of what kind of work produced the data that we've got. What's the background? What's the story? 
behind this data, okay? Was it doing normal working? Was it doing a worst case scenario, a quiet day or whatever? That has to be in the report. Now, to give you an example about uh, how we've got to be careful with data, uh, this is a site here, they're dealing with materials and uh, the materials contain the respirable crystalline silica. And the limit for respirable crystalline silica, the WEL, is 0.1 milligrams per meter cubed. Uh, I measured uh, three staff and the results came in at point, uh, conveniently 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, okay? All less than half the workplace exposure limit. Now, again, if we were face to face, I would say to you, uh, well, does that comply with the limit uh, or not? Okay. A lot of people would say it's less than half the workplace exposure limit. A lot of occupational hygiene uh, consultants out there, so called, will say to you, well, it's less than 50% the workplace exposure limit. Can't be significant. Okay. Now, we don't have time to go into the, how we do these confidence statistical tests today. But I can absolutely assure you that those results, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, are utterly indistinguishable from a non-compliant set of data. Because it's given the amount of variation you can get from day to day and worker to worker, that's not far enough below the workplace exposure limit for you to say with confidence that at other times you're compliant. Not by a mile, okay? I can talk to you later if you want to have uh, more of a discussion on that. I've got a whole different presentation on how to read occupational hygiene monitoring data. Okay, so your consultant should be applying um, good statistical tests to the data that they have. And, and the key uh, guidance to look out for is EN 689. If you've got a pen and paper, write that down. Okay, you should be using that test to look at the, uh, the data. Okay. Moving on here, report writing. Um, and when it comes to the report, uh, the key thing is uh, what we want to do is give clear, helpful advice. Bottom line is, as a consultant, is that you're being paid, you're taking people's money off them to be helpful to them. The client needs to know what needs to be done. Having 60 pages worth of data and no proper firm recommendations is not much help, okay? And those recommendations as well, they've got to reflect a gravitas, an in-depth research uh, to the problem, and not some kind of like, you know, fluffy treatment of a few two or three measurements, are they above or below a limit? That's not good enough, okay? It should have reasonable caveats in there because things vary a lot from day to day, and you should have some idea about what might be going on when you're not there. So you want to bring that to bear in the report. And then uh, for the practitioners amongst us, we all have to be careful of personal uh, bias. I can assure you that I don't care how rational you think you are. Uh, those of you who've read all the pop psychology books uh, will be ahead of me on this. <laughs> We're nowhere near <laughs> as rational uh, uh, as we think. And things like, uh, you know, whether they were nice to you in the morning with a cup of tea and a biscuit before you started uh, can make a difference to how that report's written compared to if they were all to you and, and nasty and mean when you turned up at the beginning of the day. It does. Don't kid yourselves. It does make a difference, okay? So you've got to do your best and be alert to your weakness in, in this area and let the data and the evidence uh, speak for itself as much as you possibly can. So in summary, uh, a one day survey, it sounds like a simple thing. I'll get some along for a couple of days, we'll take a few samples, we'll see where we're at. But I put it to you that it, it's really uh, straightforward. Occupational hygiene um, issues, exposures, uh, uh, depend on all kinds of parameters. You need to be very careful, planning is needed to, to make these surveys of any use. Uh, the results need careful interpretation and like this wide range of factors. If they're gonna do measurements, they've got to address the real issues and they've got to be qualified by detailed supporting information and observations. Bottom line, reports got to be helpful, properly supported with clearly listed action points and graphics. Thank you, my friends. Hope that was helpful. Thank you, Kelvin. Wow, so much occupational hygiene, isn't there? Um, I, UPS, I thought, wow, that's, uh, you know, just from the wet stuff on that, to think that would be supplied to a customer um, in that state is in itself quite amazing, isn't it? 
Yeah, but I mean, the issue there was just the, the, the logic of the thing. Okay, it didn't appear to have any chemicals, didn't appear to have any bearing on the indoor air quality, but the logic was telling that that's the only thing that's changed in the yeah. workplace. That's where we need to look. Yeah. Okay. So, Anne, how are we doing for questions? We have none, I'm afraid. Um, apart from where are we going to find a recording of uh, this uh, for uh, other people? Is it on our, our website? And it'll be on our website in a few days' time. Yep. There we are. I've got a question, Anne. Uh, I could put it to Kelvin. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in in occupational hygiene is uh, in relation to exposure to radon in the workplace. And in your experience, which is incredibly vast, and I, I know because I've worked with you in the past, how much of a problem is radon in the workplace, generally speaking, and how seriously are employers taking it? Okay, uh, well, my experience of that is like, uh, it all depends where you live, of course, yeah. yeah? <laughs> uh, and if you go online, uh, you can find a radon map of the UK, which will tell you uh, where the hot spots are. Uh, also, uh, I, I would say there's some very good guidance uh, online you can use for this. Uh, it'll tell you where the hot spots are. It'll also tell you about the features of your building structures, uh, which pose the highest risk. So that would be, for example, like a poorly ventilated basements and so forth. Now, areas where there are uh, high radon risks uh, will, will generally have well ventilated basements. They will have thought about that as part of the building design. But of course, that's not the like given, is it? Okay. So like, uh, so some of the issues I've come across uh, in the past have been, for example, like a, a chain of... Um, uh, of, of retail stores uh, across uh, the southwest uh, and elsewhere uh, where they had uh, showrooms as a basement as part of their uh, area uh, and the, the way we did it was put badges out uh, radon detection badges over several months if you're doing this folks uh, try and make sure you do it uh, in the winter now the reason for that is because it tends to be low pressure conditions in the winter and that will draw more radon out the ground than at other times so don't waste your money by doing it in the summer. Try and do it during the winter months uh, uh, if you can. Um, but bearing in mind, of course, that before you do your monitoring, uh, the guidance out there as to what you need to do to control it, which is your first port of call, is ready available on the line. Now, to carry out the monitoring, uh, there are agencies out there who, from whom you can, um, uh, and again, you can look it up online quite easily. They will supply you with the badges, and you can deploy those badges and, uh, you know, describe where you set them out, what time you put them out, send them back to the person involved, and they will tell you. Uh, what the radon dose was and whether you're above the limits or got anything uh, uh, to concerned about. So it's the kind of thing which I would encourage people not to be intimidated by. All right. There's very good guidance online and the techniques for, for monitoring it uh, are well rehearsed and there's some good suppliers out there who will help you along with it. Thanks, Anthony. I, I've got a question for you, Kelvin, about noise measurements. You said that to go from 94 dB to 88 dB was uh, the difference. Uh, how did you describe that? And how did you get to uh, that decision? Yeah, yeah. So it went from like uh, 94 decibels to 88 decibels just by slapping a bit of cardboard uh, on top of the, uh, the meter there. Now, uh, now, some of you may be familiar uh, with the decibel scale. Insofar, it's not an arithmetic scale. It's based on a, on a logarithmic calculation. Um, so, it's, so it's a logarithmic scale. I'll give you another example of a logarithmic scale. Uh, the, the Richter scale is a logarithmic scale. Now, some of you, like, um, uh, like I do a lot of work down on the Hinkley Point uh, construction site down there. We had a tremor down there a couple of years ago. It was about four, four and a half on the Richter scale. Glasses in the, rattle, in the cabinet rattled. Bobby the cat was startled, okay, at four, four and a half on the Richter scale. A few years earlier, there was an earthquake, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, about eight or nine on the Richter scale, quarter of a million dead. Well, hang on a minute. At four, Bobby the cat is startled. At eight, quarter of a million dead. What's going on there? It's because the Richter scale is on logarithmic. Every time you go from one, two, three, four, five, you're actually going up in orders of magnitude, not in an arithmetic way. Now, the decibel scale has got a little bit of a complication calculation behind it, so it's not quite as, as brute as the, as the Richter scale. Uh, but in summary, every time you go up by 3 dBA, you are doubling the amount of noise there. So also, if you reduce by 3 dBA, you're halving the amount of noise. 
So what I was able to demonstrate on this occasion that uh, this life that was rattling on 94 decibels, if you just stand and think of with it, slap cardboard on there and you've gone to 88 decibels. So that's, um, he says 94 minus 88. Can someone do the calculation on that? That's, that's a six decibel drop, okay? So that's, uh, so we've more than halved uh, the amount, I was being conservative, we've more than halved the amount of noise just by slapping a bit of cardboard on there. And I can take a photo of that and I can put that in their report and I can show the manager, look, from a simple intervention like that. And do you know what? I don't care if you've got a sound level meter, really. Uh, if you've got like an app on your phone or an app on your smartwatch, it doesn't matter how accurate it is, so long as you can shove it in a photo and demonstrate the impact of your intervention, that'll do, all right? We'll worry about the exact DBA later, but it gives you an idea by thinking through what the right kind of noise control measure is gonna be, okay? Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, uh, no. Yeah, lovely. I think we've got another one. Uh, is there any merit, merit in using a download phone app to get an early indication of noise before getting a professional survey being completed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the reasons uh, I just mentioned, the thing mm. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd point out there as well, that uh, of course they're not that accurate. Uh, uh, we know that. And you've got to be careful what DB you're measuring, okay? We're in for compliance with the noise at work regulations. The, uh, the upper limit and the lower limit are quoted as 85 dBA, all right? Now careful, because if your phone's just measuring DB, it's gonna look a pretty pessimistic estimate of what your, your, your noise level actually is. Now for peak measurements, we use DB, but not for your average measurements, that's DBA. So you've gotta be careful about that. Uh, they're brilliant, like, as I've just mentioned, for like doing a bit of uh, video, a bit of photography, a bit of theater, to ram your point home of what the uh, interventions can, can achieve for you, okay? Um, the other thing to do uh, as an initial check before you come up with measurements, let's not forget how good a rule of thumb the listening check is. So if you're standing about a meter away from somebody, meter, two meters, and you have to raise your voice to have a conversation because the noise is intrusive, that's a sure sign that you, it's about 85 or above. It's a good rule of thumb, okay? So put those two things together and I think uh, you're well on the way. And again, then, you know, um, you know, come to think of it, in the back of the noise regs and the guidance, they've got a couple of case studies in there about carrying a noise assessment. And one of the case studies merely relies on the listening check to verify that we've got a problem. And then the whole thing gears into the control element of thing, as opposed to worrying about measuring the exposure to the, you know, the, to the tenth of a decibel, okay? Cons the clues in the title is the control of noise at work regulations, not the assessment of noise. So let's let's keep a, like a, a, a attention and focus where it needs to be. Thank you, Anne, or whoever asked the question. Sorry, whoever it was. It's, Thank you. Uh, no. Karen Roger was interested in a lecture on reading data. Uh, I yep. wondered if you if you were giving them one any anywhere else. Um, I haven't got any on the books at the moment. Uh, it's normally the occupational hygienists who are phoning up uh, for that one. Um, but I'd be happy to like uh, to organise uh, something if somebody like uh, Ayosh even if you want to have like a, a session on that. Quite happy to run through, you know, how occupational hygienists decide how many samples we need, and, and then when we get the data, how we process that data and what's behind our reasoning for processing data that way. There's a little bit of a story there that's worth going through with people. And it's worth safety practitioners knowing about it. Uh, that's interesting, Calvin, because I'm uh, speaking to one of my colleagues on the branch and we're looking to plan our next 12 months programme. So yeah. I'll, I'll pencil you in. <laughs> yeah, I'd be delighted to do that. I'd be delighted to do you. that. Uh, one of the reasons for this as well, um, uh, in all my travels, um, you know, I often get to push back against my reports where they say, like, well, hang on a minute, you're telling me like... Uh, I've got all these things, the things aren't good enough, all the rest of it. All your results come in below the exposure limit. What are you on about? Yeah. And then it's it, it, once I got the chance to sit down with them and talk about the background to the data and how to read this data, they understand why we, we uh, approach things the way we do and why we interpret data the way we do. Now, uh, now I'll, I'll re emphasize this. There's a lot of practitioners out there who will gauge data, they'll color code it, whether it's um, at the OEL or above or 50% or 25%, okay? I can tell you there is no guidance out there that recommends that approach. It's become custom and practice and it's not good enough. It doesn't mean a thing. 
And if I'm, a, if I'm asked to like a, a comment or report like that, I can drive a coach and horses through people uh, interpreting data that way. And I'm not just kind of making this stuff up. I'm quoting European UK guidance on how you should interpret data. I'm not making this up, okay? We've, we've got a nice one from Kevin Stewart. I don't know if he wants to uh, unmute and ask this question. Are you there, Kevin? This, this is one of those questions. He's obviously not there. It's the one chat? of those lovely questions. He's got a client with a DBA of 82, and then they put the radio on full blast, and it yeah. goes to 88 to a 90. Wow. And uh, the excuse is that he can turn the radio off and they don't want to wear earmuffs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, some interesting things going on here is that. Um, now, I would say, first off, that uh, in my experience, anyway, that's pretty unusual. Uh, people will normally increase the volume of a radio or uh, an amplifier in, in a room to the level where they can just hear it about where the, where the workshop noise is. So if the workshop noise is about 77, 78, you'll find the radio is round about that kind of level where they are uh, as well. It's not often people will ramp it up to be like deafening uh, over everything else. Uh, if that is the case, uh, you need to manage that out. End of. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I couldn't find out to open it up. Oh, there we are. Here we are. Hello there. Hello, Kevin. It is. Uh, it's in a, an abattoir. Yeah. So you will get peaks every now and then with chains it and all this. Because yeah, yeah. the noise level is a bit uh, up and down there. But the, the, the actual volume of this radio is incredible. Yeah. yeah it's um, Whether it's because there's animals making noises as well. But when the test was done, and it's done by that, they'd done the testing. Um, so they more likely picked the quiet this time as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to tell them, no, you've got, if you're going to put the radio on, you've still got to include that. Yep. In your testing. Uh, thing. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. They're at work. This is a feature of their workplace. It's deafening them. Yeah. Got to manage that. Right. Well. Okay. Thank you for that. Good question. I, I think I think that's just about it. Uh, Michelle McDermott made, made a comment about going into a workplace and finding everybody with very shiny high vis uh, on, obviously brand new out of the cupboard. Yeah. But you you've covered that quite very well in in your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. They know you're coming. <laughs> Yeah, but you can tell, you know, and uh, you know, and, and a good practitioner should account for that in the, when they when they're making their recommendations and the like. Yeah. Thanks. No more no more questions then, Kelvin. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Steph. Thank you for the questions too. Great questions. Thank you. We see Steph's got a hand up. Steph, would you like to ask a question? Uh, no, not a question, but just to jump um, on that um, radio thing, Kevin. In in my experience, sometimes if they've just got one radio that they're using to blast out over an area, particularly if it's not a particularly good quality radio, they sometimes ramp it right up. And sometimes having some localised speakers, which you can lower the volume, provide a bit of localised sound, can be a really good recommendation to make. So that was just a bit of a point that I didn't want to sort of just jump in and cut across. I thought, put my hand up, it would be polite. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, very good point, Stephanie. Thanks for pointing that out. Wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have everything. Yeah. One that I've just seen has just popped into the chat uh, from Simon. Is there any guidance on choosing an occupational hygienist, i.e. for a tender process? Uh, yes, there is. Um, uh, everybody, please get your pens and paper out, okay? Uh, go on the BOHS website and you will find uh, the buyer's guide for occupational hygiene consultants. There's two guides, there's a consultant's guide, which is in trying to encourage our practitioners to do a, a, a good job. And then for yourselves, we have the buyer's guide. Okay? Brilliant. I should have mentioned that actually. Thank you for, thank you. Whoever asked that question, thank you for, for, for raising that. It's a good, very good point. Okay. 
No others is there any? No, none. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Okay. Dylan, what's next? <laughs> We are moving on, and if hopefully somebody can confirm that you can see the competency wheel. Yes. Excellent. Um, our competency slides this week, this event rather, this month, have been kindly provided by Martin Clark and Alan Prothero from our committee. Uh, I know Martin's on the call. Martin, would you like to unmute and talk us through these slides if I click on the screen? Okay, thank you, Dylan. Yes, if um, if I can move on to the first uh, the first slide, really, of the group, and I'll start looking at the technical side of things. Sure. Right. Right. Okay. So, referring back to Kelvin's uh, presentation, uh, the aspects that I've drawn out for for this week uh, for this month's presentation. In relation to the law, it's as as Kelvin outlined throughout the presentation. It's a, it's it's obtaining a good understanding of the legal parameters that you're working to. In this instance, in particular, in relation to measurements, etc. And then looking at the legislative frame frame frameworks that you're working to. Okay, the other aspect uh, that. Kelvin was looking at, which we've talked about again in a little bit of depth, is the cultural aspects. And we're looking at a snapshot of what's going on. You're, you're, you're witnessing the processes over a short period of time, but you're also witnessing a great range of behaviors. And as Kelvin out, outlined, are they actual behaviors or are they being exaggerated above or below the norm? Okay, if we can move on again, Dylan, thank, th thank you. Um, the other then, uh, the final aspects from a technical point of view are basically managing risk, be it health and safety or business risk. And again, Kelvin covered this in, in quite a bit of detail. He, he was looking at the aspects there of what are we, uh, what are we actually look, looking to measure? How accurate are our measurements, etc.? So he was comparing the, uh, the risks from the health and, uh, health and safety legislation side of things, and then bringing into it how practical that would be to comply with within the business. Okay, the final one that we looked at within the technical aspect uh, was looking at the policies and procedures. How can they be sustained? So it was, it was looking at how we can introduce those policies and procedures to the work, to the workforce, getting in buy-in from the work the workforce so it's not some something that's being introduced at this point in time but we're looking to sustain it throughout the fourth forthcoming life of the uh, industry okay if we can move on again core competencies the key ones that we uh, that i picked out from kelvin's presentation were strategy planning and leadership and management Again, from the strategy point of view, we were looking at, is this, is what we're doing central to the organization's success? The answer to that is obviously going to be yes, from a health and safety point of view, because we're looking after the health and well well-being of the workforce, which ultimately will, will lead to the success of the business as well. From a planning point of view, from the uh, pract pr practitioner's point, point of view, uh, we're looking at the types of data, et cetera, that we need to gain from our visit to site. So, so we're looking at how we're gonna manage that aspect, which will then lead into the collection of that data, its organization and how it's going to be presented to the client and their management team at the end of the day. The final aspect here, was the leadership and management. Again, it's getting that message over to the management team within the organization, how we're going to present it, how we're going to get the message over, what media are we going to use, et cetera. 
Okay, if we can move on to the final slide. Right. From a behavior and competencies point of view, we were looking at stakeholder management and how the workforce and management were interaction, interacting, sorry, and, and what expectations there, uh, there was from the management and the owners of the organization, et cetera. From a communication point of view, Kelvin brought out some excellent examples of how he was demonstrating how things could potentially be affecting the work the, the, uh, the workforce. So he was using dust dust lamps, he was using the noise meters, et cetera. So he's physically demonstrating there and then to the workforce what they were exposing themselves to and what actions they could then take to reduce those exposures. The final point on here then, we were looking at working with others. And one of the points that Calvin uh, brought over in, in, in some depth was persuading the, uh, the individuals that you're working with to provide the information or openly provide the information that, that you need to gather so that you're, you're getting a relaxed atmosphere and they're, and they're providing that information in a relaxed forum and, and not giving you the answers that they think you should be getting. Okay, so, so that concludes the areas we're looking at. We've covered the three areas and those areas then will go forward into your, your CPD, et cetera. I think that was the final slide, was it Dylan? Or was there another one at the end? Oh, <clears throat> that, that's it. Uh, that, that, they're the four slides and it's great. And as you say, um, we want to give people the opportunity of how each and every presentation that we deliver on a monthly basis, the intrinsic links to the IOS competency framework, the kind of events that you can be creating as CPD events, all of these things that will help demonstrate your competency when the framework comes into play and along with IOS Blueprint. So we hope you find that useful. And my many thanks to Martin and Alan for pulling those together for us. Would you like me to carry on, Keith? Yeah, go on. Thanks. I'll let you carry on. <laughs> okay, so at the end of each session now we do um, a branch networking session. So as we go through the next few slides, the next few slides are just going to give you some feedback on what we've done with, with running some polls in the previous event and also a subsequent member survey. Now, if you are on the call today and you are a member of the South Wales branch, you will have received committee mailers um, over the last few days. Um, with a link to the branch engagement survey. If you haven't already filled in, please, please, would you take the two minutes it takes just to click on the link within the committee mailer. Um, it takes a couple of minutes just to provide us some feedback. We are using this feedback to mold what we do as a branch to provide you with the best service possible. So without further ado, <clears throat> So we've asked a question in both the last event in January and through our survey about people being engaged in the mentoring program. Now you can see the figures there and quite uh, astounding that people are not engaged in the mentoring program. Uh, we can only encourage you, um, it's not mandatory. We know that people do get an awful lot benefit from the mentoring program, whether that be as a mentor, assisting people through their progression uh, through the grades, or as a mentee. If you're looking to progress and you want some assistance in any kind of area uh, of your development, we encourage you, please do get involved, register for the mentoring. We put the link up earlier. Um, you'll find it on the IOS website register it you can tailor what you want assistance with you don't have to get involved in anything that you don't need assistance with you can tailor what you need or what you can provide for others as well 
So these are the areas that we've asked um, people of what the areas of membership you find challenging that we as a branch can help you with. So we look at membership development, grade review, mentoring, Irish updates, networking availability and student members. Now, we are, um, Steph will be able to give you more detail with regards to student membership. We are doing an awful lot of work in the background with that and we will be um, providing details at future events on what we're doing with that. Membership development, um, that is actually a key aspect of our next event in March. The grades review, we are hoping that we are able to give you details very shortly on that. Um, we know that we are still awaiting the results um, from Privy Council. All of these things, um, you'll see down the bottom, people have provided, um, they've clicked other on the survey. Um, and they have then subsequently provided those details. We will be committing to reach out to those people um, and see what we can do uh, with aspects of help there. We're trying to provide the best service and quality for you as our members. Um, and in order to do that, we are asked the question about when you would like to um, have these events held, uh, whether that be in person or as in our virtual world as we still are at the minute. Interesting feedback through both the event and the member survey, which is a great, um, great feedback. We will take that on board. We will be discussing that um, at our next committee meeting and we'll provide you updates in the future. I've just seen a question pop up in the chat, um, which we will come back to, but if you have got any questions, then please either pop them in the chat, I'll be stopping sharing shortly, um, and we can have a chance to take questions. <clears throat> final question we asked, um, well, actually it's not the final question, I'll tell a lie. Um, would you be interested in presenting? Um, quite a few people have said no, not for them. Really good to see that we've had four definite yeses from the survey and seven maybes. Those people have also provided their details as part of the survey feedback, which is absolutely brilliant. And we'll be passing them on to our event coordinators uh, within the branch, passing the details on. So if you have said yes, you will get a phone call or you will get an email initially. Um, we would love to see what you can provide for the membership as presentations. We're also keen to understand when you would be likely to and willing to and feel comfortable, given the current <clears throat> pandemic and the ongoing or um, and people coming back to work, etc, is face-to-face -face events we want to try and gauge of the urgency of face-to-face -face events getting people back around the room able to network willing to and feeling happy to go to exhibitions and conferences etc so again this information and feedback was absolutely vital to us and it's really good to see those results that a lot of people are wanting to get back um, into the face-to-face -face and um, so we can take that on board and we can talk with IOSH around having face-to-face -face events and putting a business case together for that, which is great. So that's a basic um, feedback that we have. We will continue to provide the feedback as more results come in from the surveys. We'll let you know exactly what we've done with each of these now and how we've used the information and what we're doing differently to provide you with the service um, that you deserve. So just looking at the chat, what is the best way to have your membership status reviewed, please? I recall we're emailing before Christmas, but I'm yet to receive a response. Um, I'm not sure whether you emailed the branch um, because I monitor the branch email. I don't remember seeing it. 
Um, but Paul, would you like to advise on this one from an IOS perspective, the best people to contact? Yeah, I guess the easiest thing to do really, obviously the membership team and the customer service team at IOSH are able to look into uh, membership status, et cetera. So um, is it Trion, uh, Tyrion, sorry, if you can drop me your email address, I'll um, link you in with the right person at IOSH. And again, the same thing goes for anybody else who wants uh, any information from IOSH and you're not getting a response, then I'll drop my email ad address in the chat. If you can just uh, give me a call uh, or drop me a message and um, I'll... Uh, I'll put you in touch with the right people. I'll uh, drop my uh, email there in the chat box for everybody. There we go. Yeah, thanks, Tyrion. Sorry, I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce your name, but thanks for that. I'll uh, I'll get I'll get you in touch with that and copy you in. And we see you have your hand up. What can we help you with? I, I was going to say that uh, the the HSC in the annual. The HSC annual review in May is our first face-to-face -face event. I, I, I put it in the chat, but I sent it directly to Terry and not to everybody. Apologies. But yeah, May, May we, will, we will be having a face-to-face -face event in the branch. Excellent. Thank you. Um, from an update and networking perspective, um, that's all I have. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you'd like to raise your hand or pop it in the chat. Um, other than that, I will hand you back to Keith. Thank you, Donald. It's worth noting that we are trying to do hybrid as well. So, you know, we are conscious that, you know, there are members who aren't comfortable going back face to face yet. So if we can get that mix of face to face and virtual, then we will go for that. Um, which should help everybody out. So, have we got anything else? Is there anything anybody wishes to add or question before we close? <laughs>